Thank you, Nick, and everybody. And thank you, Ed TK, for the invite to be in on this. This is fun uh, being able to get to know you and interact with you. Um, open up your Bibles. We're going to tackle our topic. And so you know where we're going. I set my alarm. <laughs> because uh, I'll, I'll present this to you, but you've got it. So you don't have to scramble taking notes like crazy. Listen, interact, think. We're going to go 45 minutes, then I want you to talk about it. How many are from divorced homes? Ooh, wow. good. Good. Uh, seven of us. Uh, how, many of them, how many of you have uh, students in divorced homes and blended homes in your youth ministry? Everybody uh, has to be. So i uh, going to try and give you some things that will help you in your shepherding and leading and discipleship of those that are dealing with parents in conflict. They may not have gotten to the point of divorce. Uh, they may be blended uh, they've remarried and they are now struggling, but we're going to talk through some things. Uh, name what you think would be the most important Bible passage for a student in a divorced situation or a blended situation. What is his biggest challenge in following Jesus or hers? So if you're, you're going, I've got a divorced student. What, what biblical principle do they need to wrestle with and figure out how to obey? What does any teen need to figure out how to obey? So I'm thinking Ephesians 6. Uh, honor father and mother, the first commandment with the promise. Unfortunately, the original commandments did not have and honor your stepmother or stepfather. But my point with that is, doesn't matter, divorced, single parent, step, or intact nuclear family. That student's call in following Jesus is no different What's it look like to honor him with my attitude toward my parents, toward my step-parent, toward my dad who walked out, toward my mom who has a boyfriend that won't even talk to me or is abusive toward me? Or uh, So, uh, real important that we have some uh, scriptures. So there are some there. I want to read you two paragraphs to begin with. It says, immediate effects of divorce. So uh, here's what Dobson said. Uh, almost 20 years ago. One landmark study revealed 90% of children from divorced homes suffer an acute sense of shock when the separation occurs, including profound grieving and irrational fears, 90%. 50% reported feeling rejected and abandoned. Indeed, half of the fathers never came to see their children three years after the divorce. Half. Three years later, relationships are gone. One third of the boys and girls feared abandonment by the remaining parents. 66% experienced yearning for the absent parent with an intensity that researchers described as overwhelming. Most significant, 37% of the kids were more unhappy and dissatisfied five years after the divorce than they had been at 18 months. Dobson's conclusion, in other words, time did not heal their wounds. So I heard Jordan or somebody said, big issue of helping them with identity and who they are when the foundational things of home have been upset, shaken, uh, that's big. Here's what uh, Wallerstein talks about, and this is a, a good name to know. She's on the third page done a lot of research and writing residual effects of divorce on kids. Statistics have been out there for some time from research. Children of divorce marry less, marry earlier, and divorce more. Marry less, marry earlier, divorce more. The legacy continues. One of your challenges as a discipler and shepherd of students, you 
student, you get to choose to not perpetuate the, the tradition. Because it's often, you've seen it, two, three generations in a row, and it's just nobody blinks. It's normal. Now, it doesn't have to be that way for you. Giving hope uh, to that end. Uh, they're less likely to go to college. Children of divorce come to adult couple relationships at a disadvantage because they don't have images in their mind of a functioning man-woman relationship. They don't have confidence to say, I can do what my parents have failed to do. All children who go through divorce are at a risk. You have to come from that experience with more anxiety about establishing committed, lasting love than if you hadn't had it. The major impact of divorce on the young person is the fear that their relationships will fail. It's inherent in being raised in a divorced family. My relationships are going to fail too. So it'll go one of two ways. Try to control all their relationships, over controlling, or they'll uh, be easily detached. Oh yeah, that's my best friend for now, but I'll, I know how to pull back. Hermit crabs, big down here. What happens when you touch the hermit crab? Back into the shell, and so they'll do that emotionally as well. There are immediate effects, there are residual effects. Page three of your outline, flip over there, uh, and then I want to uh, say something about uh, the, the fourth page that you've got as well. Uh, there's an article, Dan Quayle was right. Anybody wants to see it? Do you remember who Dan Quayle was? <laughs> A few of us are old enough. Uh, Vice President Dan Quayle. And he wrote an article in The Atlantic in 1993. I believe. So uh, they did a landmark study on, and this lady is, uh, is describing the results of the study uh, of longitudinal study of children of divorce. Nothing Christian about it, but it is the research. I've pulled it out of my file when I have couples come to me talking about uh, they think they're just going to hang up their marriage, uh, bail out. Uh, the kids will be fine. Resiliency, kids' hearts are resilient. Uh, I'm, I try to get those parents to read this before they take any other further steps. Because the bottom line from secular sociologists as far back as 1993 was it's hogwash uh, and her conclusion is we are the first generation of adults to sacrifice our children on the altar of our own selfishness that'll preach first generation to sacrifice our kids on the altar of our own selfishness now, nobody go, no set of parents goes into marriage thinking, oh, yeah, we'll try this for a while and then hang it up. At least nobody that's got Jesus in the equation. So I know there's stuff that happens and people turn away from the Lord and relationships are broken. So what's it mean to help a student when relationships are broken? They are dealing with the wreckage afterwards and trying to figure out what's it look like to take steps in my life toward maturity, especially with Jesus. And that's what the handouts are for. So fourth page comes from a book. Let me grab it quick. Oh, let's see. Those will fly around probably. I brought two of these. I'll leave them up here next to the television. You want to look at it for all three of our topics. Uh, some of these come out of homework manual for biblical living. Uh, there's also a scripture reference for counseling youth. This would be worth having in your library. For those moments when somebody comes and you're going, where do I go in God's word to help them with it? It's got everything you can imagine in here. And so I copied the page on di uh, divorce and gave it to you. That's the fourth page. So what's on page one listing a whole bunch of scriptures? Well, they're actually spelled out here on the, the last page of the outline on divorced parents. Okay, so uh, seek support from God. So this is, these are passages to go to with students whose parents have divorced. Most of the principles apply here if the parents are in conflict. 
and you don't know yet if it's going to end up in divorce or not. Great collection on what does God think about divorce? Why did he permit it? What was Jesus' answer? Yeah. Yep, so you look on the right side, Matthew 19. And they decide, well, why did Moses allow for divorce then? It's because of the hardness of your hearts. Uh, so it's uh, so. This is just a great collection. The call for forgiveness. Number five: the youth must forgive his or her parents for any wrongdoings that brought about the divorce. So good helps. And those passages, you go. Where did Barlow get the list of? Back to page one. Where'd that list of passages come from? Comes from there. Plus, I added a few. Uh, to it, and you can write in Ephesians uh, chapter 6. The call, children, obey your parents uh, in the Lord. Why? First commandment with a promise. That honoring of father and mother. Okay, I want to throw in uh, quickly, and then maybe that'll prompt questions for you as we go. Uh, my biggest step in dealing with a really uh, dysfunctional relationship with my dad that we married young and so we still dealt with it thereafter was trying to come to terms with that honoring of him because I didn't respect him. So what I say to students, collegians, and adults, in Greek there's no difference between respect and honor. It's one word. But in English, two different words. And, and so part of the way I tried to navigate things was God has called me to honor my dad. Didn't respect what, where he was spiritually, what his life had become, how he treated me, uh, what he had done with the marriage. Uh, but uh, I don't have to respect him to honor him as, as my dad. You can think about that some and think about how that would work out in, in talking with one of your students. Two primary tasks when you're helping a student. One, comfort in the losses. Two, challenge in the lies. So if you can remember those two things, that's where you want to go with a student. Comfort in the losses. Uh, it's multi-layered. So, that, so they have to go and live with a step parent. They just lost their friends, lost their school setting. They have to start over. It's not just what I've lost with my parent. It's what I've lost in terms of grandparents. It's what I have to figure out how to navigate then when there is remarriage. Because the statistics are at the top of page two. No, top of page three are the statistics on what happens in terms of remarriage. 80% of men, 70% of women will remarry. So it's a rarity to have a student that's just with a single parent. Most of the time it's going to be a step uh, constellation that they're figuring out how, how to navigate. Might be healthy, might not. Uh, Hebrews 4. Let's look at that for a minute. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Comfort in the losses. Who understands what they are going through? Yeah. Yep. Sounds trite. But you can take them to, yeah, I know your heart hurts. It should hurt. The, there are parts of this that should make you angry. There are parts of it that you go, uh, I don't know what this is going to look like for me in the future. I thought I was going to be able to go to college. Now my parents are divorced. They can't afford for co college for me anymore. Now what do I do? Layers. Layers. And if you can with them say, okay, who understands? Who's going to walk this path with you? Who's carrying you through all of this? The answer is Jesus. God, God understands. So we have a great high priest who's gone through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So comfort in the losses, your role may be to grab them by the arm and say, come on, 
I know right now you're confused, even mad at God. You want to shake your fist at him about what's going on with your home, with your step home. You grab their arm and we are going toward God as you deal with this. Because he understands. He's still got a hold of you. Um, he is able to sympathize. If you are from a solid nuclear home and you go, I I've never walked the path with you that, that you're on. It's okay. The Lord is able to sympathize. So uh, Hebrews 4 would be good and valuable for you as you interact with them. Uh, the difficult experience drives any of us to the Lord for love, help, comfort, and forgiveness, specifically for them toward their parents. I like what one speaker said, the cross is bigger than what your parents did wrong. True for us, true for them. And 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul asks and says, take this away, take this away, take this away, and God says, no, no, no. Next verse is, yeah, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. And then he goes, therefore I'll all, uh, I'll all the more gladly boast in my weaknesses, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Yeah, so uh, comfort and losses, yeah, this stinks. You don't have to pretend, uh, but walk and acknowledge the losses with them. Challenge in the lies. List the lies. What impairs them as a student from continuing in their, in their development is, uh, is not what has happened. It's how they how they process it and the meaning that they attach to it. So, they're going to be a victim of divorce or are they going to be a lifelong casualty? Victim, yes. Lifelong casualty, no. The answer depends on the meaning they attach to the experiences. What causes the ongoing difficulty is the meaning they attach. My life is ruined. Dad's off with another woman and uh, my life is destroyed. Or the flip side of so flippant about it. Oh, yeah, Dad's got a new girlfriend. I don't care. I was closer to that side. Dad didn't have a girlfriend, but my, my, uh, it had gone long enough. And uh, my mom and dad separated and everybody asked, are you okay? Yeah, frankly, it's just forced me to grow up quicker. Because I, I had enough uh, support in Boy Scouts. I didn't know the Lord yet. Boy Scouts and the oldest of five boys. Um, and so it was just, okay, good. Life is calmer at home because dad's gone. And I pretended there weren't any losses. I would have been on the flippant side of the scale. Uh, they may believe the, the lie. Dad left. I'm the cause. I'm damaged goods. Dad left. Or the, the contrast here is between one and two. Dad left. I've learned forgiveness is important to growing spiritually and resisting bitterness. I've had to learn how to relate to dad and his new wife. I think I know better now how to turn to God in my disappointment. You're trying to walk students to number two instead of number one. So it's challenged the lies. No, your life isn't ruined. No, God hasn't abandoned you. Uh, see, uh, what's the truth about what has happened as opposed to the lies that they're tempted to believe? So dialogue, asking questions about it. Identify the meaning the student has attached to the experience. They put the wrong meaning on it, the pain is doubled. Still painful, but when you, you turn it back on yourself and you close off, uh, you don't see any hope it's doubly uh, disturbing. Um, student doesn't seem to want to talk about it. Parent asks you to talk with their student. You know there are things they're struggling with, but they don't want to bring it up. Parent hopes you can get them to talk. What do you do? Let's meet at Starbucks. Do you try and pry them open or do you leave them alone?
So I asked a friend of mine who went through that exact situation with his kids and youth ministry, and I said, uh, how would you answer that? And his answer is down below. Should there be an intervention or not? If they are impaired or maladjusted, get your can opener out. <laughs> and uh, nope, we, we aren't leaving here till you tell me what's going on inside because you're starting to harm yourself in the process and hamstring yourself. Uh, so you need to talk. I don't want to. Uh, versus if a student's doing well, let them, let them alone. Let them be. Let them bring it out in their time. Why? Because they're still developing the, the part of their brain that is going to deal with what are the long-term consequences and how do we interpret this. The, they're not fully developed there yet. So from a developmental standpoint, you as a leith, youth leader get to try to assess. Hmm, nope, they look like they're doing pretty well. I think they're all right. Uh, they're functioning well with their peers. They're, best I can tell, they're seeking God. Good, I'll encourage them. I know the day is going to come when they're going to need to talk about it and process it. Uh, this friend said what he finds is it's freshman and sophomore year of college is the time where everything kind of explodes. Because they've figured out how in middle school and senior high to just kind of navigate with their peers and their activities. It's when they leave home and they're now in the college context, and they're trying to define what am I going to be, and what am I going to do with relationships, or they get their first serious girlfriend, boyfriend, and they're thinking, am I doomed to repeat the same mistakes? That's when they're ready to talk about it. So they might be in middle school, might be in senior high, or it might come a little older. They're home on Christmas break, their freshman year of college, and they say, uh, Tyler, can I talk to you? Because that's when things have started to bubble to the surface. So comfort in the losses, challenge in the lies. Five things every child of divorce needs to hear or resolve. It's okay to still love both of my parents. So that's where Ephesians 6, your issue of respect, loyalty. I'm not responsible for my parents' breakup, for getting them back together, for taking care of them now that they're alone. Uh, very common for a responsible, especially a firstborn, to say my job to make sure mom's okay. Had a 29-year-old come to me, hadn't talked to him in probably six years, and he contacted me uh, about a year and a half ago and said, can I come talk to you? And so we sat down. Uh, when he was 12, his dad had a new girlfriend and so had him and his younger brother together and said, um, you, need, you need to take care of mom now. And he just shifted into this pattern from 12 to 29. And he was now happily married and going and, and seeking the Lord, trying to sort things out spiritually. said, we want to start a family. But I told my wife, no way we're starting a family until... I'm over, uh, I've resolved things with dad. He, he got stuck for 17 years as the custodial parent from 12 to 29. Um, and, but he's taken great steps over the last year of trying to resolve some of those pieces with his dad. He had to come to terms with, I'm not responsible to take care of mom. Third, I don't have to be perfect to keep my parents from divorcing me or losing their love for me. I'm not an inferior person or damaged goods because of my parents' divorce. And their divorce doesn't ruin my future or condemn me to repeat their mistakes when I'm an adult. Uh, they do, though, need to find a biblical picture of marriage. So they're going to have to look to another couple and say, who is worth imitating here? respectfully, but respectfully toward their, their parents, but looking for, here's what I want to go after. Uh, I've said to people for years, Christy and I will be married 42 years next week. Tuesday. Next Tuesday, a week from today. That's right. Uh, I got married on the defensive, not offensive. I knew what I didn't want our marriage to be. 
but I wasn't mature enough yet to know what I wanted it to be. What was I going after? What was the goal line? I knew what I didn't want to give up and where I didn't want to go. And I, I think that was a pretty normal coping mechanism on my part of just, uh, and we got married at, uh, I was 19. You fit the you got married young. Yep, I got married young. Yep, very much. Um, most, uh, and then third thing, convictions about marriage coming out of divorce. You may have an opportunity in discipling. Again, might be once they're at college age, but might be senior high, where you get to talk about what do you think marriage is supposed to be? What do you want yours to be? Uh, how are you going to find a... Uh, you look at the church family, who are models that you look at and go, I'm curious. wonder how they've made that work. It's a great conversation to have with students. Uh, if the parents haven't divorced yet and what they're dealing with is lots of conflict at home, you've just got these same principles earlier. It, it just, there isn't a period at the end of the sentence yet, but there are issues on I've got losses because I go home and mom and dad are fighting all the time, or dad's never around, or mom's crying all the time and I don't know what I should do about it. Divorce may not have happened yet, but all the dynamics of single parenting, all the dynamics of loss are already there uh, in terms of your shepherding. Uh, asked uh, a friend of mine, said, what, uh, what do you think is most important? And the bottom of this page really surprised me. Uh, he said, most important intervention when it comes to your interaction with the parents is to get them into a course uh, he said, an intensive course on parenting in a blended family. Someone who can be the referral and understands the first two to three years of blending. So in our churches, if it's true that 80% or 75% remarry, we're going to get a larger and larger percentage of folks in our church families who are blended. We typically get the people that things fell apart somewhere else and they come to our church already remarried and already blended. We've never done anything with a blended parenting course, help, counsel. So this was very convicting to me. And the point was there are extra challenges. The, the chemistry is different in a blended parenting context than normal. Because you aren't just as a youth leader now dealing with uh, most of my youth pastoring was all just thinking normal, normal nuclear families. When I was in Pennsylvania, it was very traditional. I can't even remember if we had any kids from divorced homes, but it was all intact. Not anymore. And so the giving help and pointing to someone who is a godly source. So I asked, well, who are, who are possibilities? So there's two things uh, I wanted to show off here. This is on your resource list. Uh, this is my friend. Kevin was my mentor when I was a youth leader. And Kevin is now chief of staff of a big church down in Knoxville, Tennessee. He wrote Parenting Adolescence years ago. It's in the 90s, but some really good things in here. Uh, and you can thumb through it if you want to. Uh, Kevin said one of the best resources, the name uh, Ron Deal. I can't vouch for the book because I haven't read it yet. But when I talked to Kevin, he said, this is who I'd look to. Mo he says, most respected guy in uh, our kind of churches, the evangelical churches, serious about the scripture, who is speaking about what's it like to parent and build a marriage and a blended family, second marriage and, and caring for kids and stepkids. So you can leave through that also if you want to. I brought this. This is one of the series of New Growth Press booklets. We keep bunches of these at our church. Uh, they've got about 100 different topics. This one happens to be children of divorce, children and divorce. How to help them. This is aimed at not just teens. This is elementary also. But Amy Baker has written a book. I don't know if it's on your resource list. Amy Baker has a whole book dealing with this, the emotions dealing with uh, divorce. Is she on there? Oh, okay, that, that's a uh, talk that she did. 
Anyways, you can look at that uh, as a uh, resource for you. Remarriage is often more difficult on students than the divorce in the first place. Ooh. Might be healthier than what they knew before. My mom's second marriage was just as awkward as her first. And I said, Mom, you sure you're gonna, you, you want to do this? We don't even know if he lo- knows the Lord. I don't want to be lonely the rest of my life. My mom's an amazing lady. Uh, single parented, five of us. I was a freshman when my folks separated. My youngest brother was five. She had five of us and went into the workforce for the first time. So, uh, I was in college. We had been married about a year. And she says, I'm, I'm going to marry Larry. You sure? Two years later, she says, I can't believe how much like your father he is. She read a book on women who loved too much. Women who love too much. The pattern of you, you tend to remarry the same kind of person that, that you had the first time around. Um, and praise be to God and my mom's uh, stick to She carried that marriage through till the time Larry died. Uh, but was uh, a lot of awkwardness, a lot of difficult moments. Uh, Amy Baker gives you what's on the third page there. Nine emotional reactions. Research says these are normal reactions for children and teens. Sadness, depression, a variety of kinds of withdrawal, uh, denial, embarrassment, intense anger, guilt, because now they're stuck having to choose. Uh, typically, the guilt comes because, oh, was it my fault? Did I drive my parent away? And now what do I do to? My guilt was, all the way even after we were married, uh, dad was a scorekeeper. If I spent three hours at Thanksgiving with mom, I was supposed to spend three hours with him. Three hours with mom was fun. Three hours with him, not. And I had to have a major shift in my heart to I'm not going to go out of guilt or obligation. I'm going to go because I desire to serve and love him. Almost nobody loves him. Uh, uh, I'll go, but God, you're going to have to help me (laughs) in going there with a sense of uh, ministry and compassion instead of obligation and guilt. Uh, Concern about being cared for, even if the family is affluent. Who's going to look out for me now? Am I on my own? Regression. Lack of normal development, return to dependency. So somebody becomes clingy, middle schooler, but they, uh, I'm gonna spend all my time with mom and, and, and hugging and clingy and uh, regression. I was the opposite, I did adultification. I was uh, from sophomore year on. It's like, okay, I got more freedom now. And yeah, I cared about mom, but I was more I was going on with my life. Became an adult at, what, 16? Really? I thought I was. Um, A maturity foisted on them by circumstances that often separates them from their peers and physical symptoms. Uh, Headaches all the time, stomach aches all the time. They've internalized the tension and the pressure and the hurt, the losses. Areas in which they're likely to struggle, fear, and a couple of you mentioned that right at the beginning. Uh, Anger toward either parent, toward the step-parent. I want to tell the story on Kevin. He knows I tell the story. Uh, His wife left him. Ed Ed and I were both close friends with, with him for years. His wife left him, was still in love with her high school boyfriend, and went off three three daughters and they were from uh, early high school down to elementary in their ages and so I'm assuming well all three girls are just gonna latch on to dad well nope the youngest went with mom the other two are with dad then the oldest turned on dad and went to live with mom I said how in the world do you process that Because by now, mom was off in a horrible, ungodly, turn your back on everything that you used to stand for context. Why would the oldest go and sympathize there 
instead of with dad. And I don't know that uh, he ever came up with a good answer to that, but his response to me was, kids in a divorce have to figure out who to blame. And their choices are blame mom, blame dad, or blame God. He said, frankly, I'd rather have her mad at me than at God. Think that one through for a minute. So he's willing to see the relationship strained and see her make, what in the world is going on here? But instead of building his case, here's what's wrong with your mother and why don't you stay with me? You let go. That's uh, because, got a couple more things we'll, we'll hit here. Uh, down under uh, helping the children. Uh, what's God's goal in the process? Uh, Amy Baker is especially good with this. We want to go, I, I just don't want to hurt again. That was painful. So I'll handle other relationships, including my dating or potential marriage. Uh, rela- I'll handle those in a way that I'm never hurt again. How's that going to work? Why? Hard to trust, hard to move on. What's the percentage likelihood that they cannot be hurt in a relationship again? My wife's got zero. Life in a broken world. Welcome to we're all sinners. So uh, the notion that you can just hunker down or guarantee you're not going to be hurt. Not, and that's not God's goal for that student, that young adult moving forward. What's God's goal? Given you everything you need for life and godliness. Yeah, but you don't understand. My parents did. Given you everything you need for life and godliness. God's goal? It's like what Bree said this morning. Okay, I don't understand the illness, but God's, God's going to use it. He's got a purpose in what he's doing in me. So nobody's asking you to be happy about what's going on with your parents or the choices that they've made. But to think God is detached from that and just going, good luck. No, he's trying to produce some things in you. And uh, my wife uh, said, I don't know, we've been married a couple of years, and she says to me, you know why you're going through all this with your dad? I said, no, why? This is one of the really bad times. Then later in life, manic depressive. I was the, I'm the oldest of the five, so I was the problem. I was the cause of the divorce. Um, I knew that wasn't true, but it still did mind games with me. And she said, the reason you're going through a lot of this is because you're going to be in a position in working with other people where you're going to understand things about their path that other people aren't. I'm like, oh. <laughs> uh, and exactly right. It's like, did God have purposes in what it produ- in producing things in me that wouldn't have come except for what went on with my parents. Now I go, absolutely. Your teen just won't be mature enough and won't have the life experience enough yet to be able to, to do that. So you grab them by the arm and you reassure them with hope. Helping children, uh, the difference between their goal and God's goal Uh, Teach them the love of God makes it possible to have pleasing God as the goal of our life. So my goal isn't to avoid pain. My goal isn't to get my parents back together. My goal isn't to make my mom dump her dumb boyfriend. My goal is to honor God with my heart. Uh, Teach them how to handle fear in a way that pleases God in the midst of the scary. You don't know how this is going to unfold. But God does. He will never leave you or forsake you. Teach them to have a forgiving attitude. I think kids that have uh, and students who've gone through conflict at home and watching things with their parents, I think they have the opportunity to learn how to be excellent, forgiving, unconditional love spouses when their time comes. Forgiving, loving, unconditional love, commitment, friends right now. 
teach them about, I, I love this phrase, uh, God's goodness. I think this was Amy Baker also. It's, it's not going to be okay, but God's got this. Is, I think, a great uh, summary of what you want to speak into their lives. And it may mean Romans 12. Great passage on, it, it's up to God to avenge. When the, settling the score isn't their responsibility, they don't need to do it. If one of the parents is particularly guilty or needs to be held to account, God's more than able to do that. Uh, their job is to kill them with kindness. It's the uh, return good for evil. Uh, and, and the passage talks about heap, uh, heap burning coals. <laughs> it quotes the proverb about heap burn, burning coals in their lap. Kill them with kindness. They mistreated you. You don't like the pattern that they've set. Um, God's enabling me to love and show kindness to you in a way that you don't even understand uh, through the work of the Holy Spirit.